anyone uh, is anyone familiar with care or yeah. well, a little bit? All right, okay, okay. What what do you know about care? That's what we like to say. We defend, empower, and educate. I'm also here with one of our board members, David Shammy. He's an attorney, so when you hear me say something wrong, he'll tell you that's not true. So, <laughs> But I want this to be um, as open as possible, so if anyone has any questions at any time, feel free to stop me. Um, we're having, we have a sign-in sheet going around if you want to get more information. Stay up to date. We have a newsletter. Follow us on social media, all that good stuff. But we'll start with the presentation today is uh, Know Your Rights presentation. It's going to be a, do we have a question? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me go to the first slide. About us. So as I said, CARE Arizona is a civil rights nonprofit. It stands for the Council on American Islamic Relations. Our main headquarters is in DC, but we have chapters all across the states. California has four. We represent all of Arizona. And there's a misconception. Do we only represent Muslims? Do we represent non-Muslims? We defend civil rights. So whatever case comes our way, we're going to take a look at it. Granted, we are primarily funded through the Muslim community, so obviously we're here to defend Muslim civil rights. But we've taken cases where someone, unfortunately, because how racism works, you look brown, you, everyone assumes you may not be, you may be a Muslim. So we defend everybody. Um, as I said, we defend, empower, and educate. My job is to defend, empower, and educate. I defend all the rights. We want to educate on everyone because if you have to come to me, so you have to first know that there's a violation. And the other one is empower. One of the biggest uh, passions I have is to get people politically active. And I, that doesn't just mean run for office, which everyone should think about, but it's to hold those who represent us accountable. Because you'll see in this presentation, there's going to be a part that says we the people. And that's important to understand. Our government works because we give it power, so we have to hold them accountable. So this is CARE Arizona. This is the team. Um, I'm Ahmed. I'm, I'm that guy. But <laughs> go to the next slide. So let's start off. Where can I find my rights? You guys could see here, so I'm not, I'm not going to pick any of you guys. But if something happens to you, where's the first place you're looking for for where your rights are? Police. So if, you, if you've been discriminated, you're going to the police first? <laughs> Well, if, if it's a criminal matter, obviously, yes, definitely get law enforcement involved. But, you know, if someone um, cheats you out of a, a, a housing bid, you know, a lot of times people's first reaction is Google, which is not a bad option. Google has a lot of answers. Sometimes it's wrong, so we don't, you know, take it 100%. That's a great place to find my rights. And when I talk about my rights, what are we talking about? Just because the law is so big, there's so many rights that we all have. We're going to start getting to the nitty and gritty. So let's get specific with there's federal laws. So there's laws of the United States of America, and then there's state laws. So Arizona has their own specific laws. We're going to talk about housing rights in a little bit, and you'll, I'll tell you that there is both a United States federal fair housing laws, and then Arizona made their own fair housing laws. Usually it's the same because, you know, why we create the wheel. So if the federal government ready works, we're going to copy it. But you're protected on both levels, which is important because sometimes the damages can be different. And at the end of the day, it's all about the, all about the Benjamin. So we have both federal and state laws. We're going to continue with this. Where can I find my rights? So we already said Google, but laws are written down. One of the uh, fundamental places where a, a lot of our rights come from is, like I said, the Constitution. Now, that's where the general ideas come. We have the freedom of association, freedom of religion. I heard Second Amendment over here, right to bear arms. The 14th Amendment, which is my favorite, it says equal protection under law. So the states can't discriminate against another person. So the Constitution is a great place to look up. But, you know, that's, that's a paper. We're not, we're not going to go from there. There's, there's other laws that have evolved because there's only so many amendments. Everyone remember school, Schoolhouse Rock, the little bill? A little piece of legislation is, a, is law too, so let me get away from here. So laws are just written by normal people, and that's the, one of the things that I want everyone to notice. That Let's say I am a Lakers fan. I don't like the Boston Celtics. I'm a congressman. I know what, I don't want anyone to be a Boston Celtics fan anymore. I want to outlaw that. Well, I go in Congress, pass a law. might not be constitutional, but that's how easy laws are created. So 
one of the things you'll hear over this presentation is that, yes, sometimes we have to use attorneys, but we have the ability to change laws, and if we want to make more protections for our people, that's a one way of doing it. So there's the school, help, the school bell surat. We also have the courts. Our court systems create laws as well. That's an important play. That's where the attorneys come in and stuff like that. But sometimes the courts can be tricky because it's whoever, whoever's on the bench at that time. I see some future judges right here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. I see him. I see him. So, I mean, do you guys want to put your rights to these three? I don't know. I don't know. No. <laughs> but like I said, Arizona has their own laws as well. So, we have our federal laws. So, Greg Stanton, Senator Kirkpatrick, Senator McSally, these are the people who create those laws. And then we have Arizona law, so Governor Ducey, uh, Senator Tony Neverett. So there's a lot of different ways we could improve civil rights. But now we're going to get to the actual meat and potatoes of the presentation. I'm going to go over employment, housing, law enforcement, and airport scenarios. If anyone has any specific questions, like I said, feel free to raise your hand. And I'll answer them. So in the employment field, both the federal law and state laws protect your right to, uh, to um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the word, to, to practice your religion in the workplace. What it really comes down to is this standard right here, a reasonable, sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's like more over here. We're gonna, we're gonna try it again. All right, there we go. So, like I said, we have reasonable accommodation versus undue burden. That's the test that we're gonna put your practice into this little machine and it's not going to come out perfectly but this is the test that we use so one of the examples I always like to go to is praying at work let's say you're at the job and you want to pray can your employer tell you no how many people think yes the employer tell you can tell you no you can't pray at work let's let's get a show of hands we got, we got, okay, okay, we got a maybe, not a no. How many people say, yes, your employer can do that? Okay, okay, all right. Well, it all depends because, like I said, you have to put your issue into this little machine and it comes out with a judgment. So usually, 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 prayer is not something that is going to be an undue burden for your workplace. People take smoke breaks, people take lunches, people, you know, go on an emergency call, prayer, quick five minutes, that's usually not a burden. Let's go to maybe a hijab at the workplace. Same thing. It's, it's usually, usually not an undue burden on the workplace for someone to wear a hijab, for someone to wear a beard, for someone to wear a kufi, for someone to fast. However, it can get to be an undue burden depending on the job. So there's a famous case where a firefighter couldn't keep his beard because the, the oxygen mask needs to be sealed tight and the facial hair would be an undue burden. So that person had to shave his beard. But let's say someone is um, working at Best Buy. Probably not an undue burden for Best Buy to say you have to shave your beard. So whatever, uh, pr whatever you want to do at your work is usually going to be a reasonable accommodation. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes let's say you're working at a factory and it's a specific, you're on the line and you can't go for five minutes. Well, that might be an undue burden. So it's fact uh, specific, but I, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't act and practice your religion. You have these laws and it's, I don't want you to ever feel that you are being an undue burden by just asking for, to practice your religion. Everyone has this ability. Joe is asking for Sunday to go to church. Someone else is asking for this day. So it, it is the laws that we have. So we gotta use them. If they say no, give us a call, I'll, I'll talk to them. So that's employment, any questions before we go? And if any females have any questions, give it to RSLE and I'll swing by after, so. No questions, all right, we'll go to the next one. Good one, good one. So let's say, and we're not talking about school, let's say you wanna have Eid off 
at your job? Well, it depends. Do they give, usually they're going to give people Christmas off. But is your job uh, a point where you could have uh, requested off through a holiday, like you had PTO or something like that? That's going to be w uh, a question for the courts. It's not a bright line yes. That's a, that's a tough one. You got me. You got me. But I would argue, though, that you have that time off through PTO, so you probably could use that. But you brought up a good question. Then they're going to hit you with, well, Ahmed said Eid is on Thursday. Why are you saying it's on Friday? So that one's, you know, that's, that's a little grayer. But you brought a good point. What happens if you say, I need Fridays off for Jummah. I'll come in an hour early for work, so I make that hour up. And the employer could say, well, you know what? No, that doesn't work for us. We need you to come, off s we need you to come Saturday. You get all of Friday off. But you're like, well, I didn't want to work on the weekends. I just want to come in an hour early. I want to come in an hour late. This, um, the reasonable accommodation standard, it's not what you, it's not the preferred accommodation you want. It just has to be reasonable. So if the employer comes back to you and say, no, you know, we're going to have to get you on Saturday. You can't come in an hour early. That's not going to work for us. Then that's a question on, well, okay, that's going to be, you have to decide, do you want to actually sue on that? Because the only person who decides it's reasonable is a judge. So just because you have the right to reasonable accommodation doesn't mean you have the right to the accommodation that you want. So that's a good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes. If, so, great. That actually ties into schools. A lot of schools, uh, school districts, recognize aid as a day off, and they take it off. Uh, always, Dearborn's always advanced. We can't, <laughs> that's not fair to include them. But, <laughs> but Washington, California, all those states. Well, I think it goes to which level we want to go. If we want the United States government to uh, recognize aid, then we need, on the federal level, our senators, our congresswomen, our Congress people to make a law, but let's say we want Arizona. Well, we know we go to our Arizona representatives, but let's just say um, I'm, I'm from Tempe. Our school district is Kyrene. Let's just say I'm trying to get the Tempe school district board. So I'm going to go to them. I'm going to uh, use my political power and lobby them and say, hey, listen, you know, we have this big majority of Muslim students here. They're all going to miss this day any, anyways for Eid. Can you guys, you know, accept this as a date? They say no. Well, my answer to that is you run for their office, you run for their position, and you take it. So it, it, is, po it is possible. It's just a political process. It's not something that um, you fight through the law. So you, that political power, which, like I said, goes to schools. Sure. Very progressive school. So we had an uh, uh, answer from the, uh, yeah, I'm calling you guests, but we had an answer that in Scottsdale they take over, they take Passover and Hanukkah off just because they have a huge Jewish population. And one of the things here is that's because, you know, they're going to show up to their school district and say, hey, listen, it's not just me, it's this person, this person, we have the numbers, the, a big amount of people are going to be missing. So it's that political power. But when I moved back from Arizona, I didn't know who my state representatives were. And I'm like, for me, I'm like, they're not going to be on, you know, CNN. They're not going to be on Twitter. The, the stuff they do, I'm not going to see. But then I started to realize, well, these are the people where not only do they impact my day to day, but these are the people that are easiest for me to go to speak to. I could go talk to Tempe City, you know, uh, council super easy, then fly out to D.C. or go here. So that political accountability is important. Going to schools, you have the right to organize an MSA, you have the right to pray. You definitely, if they're giving a, let's say they have a Christian uh, student society, they're giving them their own room for, let's say, um, for like a chapel or something like that. The school then, if Muslim students say we want our own room just like them, the school has to provide one for them or they'd be discriminating. So that's the, that's the uh, third bullet. You have the right not to be discriminated because of your religion. Let's say you have 
uh, thank you. Let's say you have a situation where the school says no headwear, but you say I'm wearing my hijab. Then it comes back to that uh, accommodation. It's going to be very hard for a school to, for a school to show a reason why. I was just in Tucson giving this presentation to uh, U of A students, and you know I grew up the ASU just because I'm an ASU alum. Tucson is like a whole different country, but <laughs> no, I'm messing. I'm messing. Uh, a sister told me she works in a lab, and they said you can't wear um, a hijab and you can't wear um, modest dress, long dress, because um, it's flammable and there's chemicals and everything like that. So that was a situation where I say, you know what, I want to look more into that because are other people allowed to wear long dresses? Are other people allowed, maybe not who have a headscarf, but are other people wearing baggish clothing? Because I can understand, a, a school can make an argument that, hey, listen, we have all these chemicals, something might catch on flame. All right, that's an undue burden. But if they're treating other people differently, that right there is what the laws are supposed to protect against. So that's a situation where there may be an actual answer, there might be an actual good excuse, but we want to look deeper into that. One thing you'll hear me repeat a lot, when I get calls, the first thing I ask is, what proof do you have? I mean, you're telling me a story, I get it, and I'm sorry, I feel bad for you, but what are you giving me to go argue for you? A lot of times, we don't see the discrimination until it's right in the face, too late. We don't know where we're at, and we're like, yeah, it's, it's too late. So that's why I always say, if you're asking for an accommodation, and this goes kind of back to employment, don't just go, hey, you know, boss, I need Fridays off. Is, is that okay? Cool. And just go off the mouth of word. Send an email. See, most works might have an actual form that says, if you need an accommodation, this is the form to use. And if you do it verbal, send an email to follow up. Say, hey, great talking to you. I just asked for this off. Thank you for giving it to me. Let's say you're in a situation where, uh, you know, someone walks by you and says, you know, something off color, uh, an Islamophobic statement. You might not be able to get that statement because, you know, if you're not wearing the wire at all times. But you could say, all right, he said this to me, 3.30 p.m. He told, you know, Linda was there, Brandon was there, Ahmed was there. We all heard it. And if you want to go the next step, ask them, would you back me up if I went to report this to my HR manager to get those people? Because then, if you're coming to me with this big paper trail, then your case is something that can actually win. Because it's not if you're discriminated, it's what you can prove. That's, that's the big thing. So always have a paper trail. So we're going from schools. Any questions on schools? All right. Housing. Housing is one of my favorite parts of civil rights, just because I think if you're being discriminated at your home, you can't succeed in other ways. I mean, I go home to de-stress, everything in the world, that's, that's my place. If I'm being pushed out of my home, if I'm having someone discriminate me in my home, how can I have success in other fields? So there is an Arizona Fair Housing Act. There is a federal Fair Housing Act. Relatively new. A lot of people think these civil rights have been, you know, since our de uh, Declaration of Independence, but we have 1968 is when our federal government decided that housing was a group of rights that needs to be protected. So housing is bigger than just being denied a mortgage, just being denied a, um, an actual showing at the apartment. It also includes, once you're in there, if your HOA is discriminating against you. So the one issue with housing is it's that proof. How do you prove that this person is discriminating against this person? Because we know that there were practices that were targeting minorities called redlining. So it's, it's how do we prove this? Well, the bigger picture is you could, there's, there's groups that do testing. So they send one person in. Okay, we're gonna, not going to give it to you because you're a minority. They send another person in who's not a minority and say, we're going to give it to you. But we're not all, that's, that's not how we're going to happen to me. How you could realize it is by just looking and understanding what's happening to you. So let's say you are a family and you go to an apartment to rent and you see that the uh, person who's showing you the apartment says, oh no, we'd actually, this is not for, uh, you know, um, we don't have any more rooms, you know, something like that. But then down the hall you see all these other families that are there and you wonder what, I mean, there's this empty room right here, what's, what's wrong with that? So it's just picking up. Sometimes, hey, the room is already sold, but sometimes it isn't. So that's something you always want to be on the lookout for. So 
the other part of housing too is there's reasonable accommodation. So let's say you're at your house and you have an emotional support animal. That's a little bit dicey, but as long as it's not like a turkey, if <laughs> it's an emotional support dog, you have that right to that reasonable accommodation if it's a no pet zone or anything like that. So any questions on housing? So how many of you people, how many of the people here know people who have had a hard time renting a house or renting an apartment? Does anybody know anybody that that's happened to? Because I've been with CARE for like five years now, and we've had a lot of people, especially in the last five years, we had a lot of people come from Iraq, a lot of people come from, the, from Syria um, who've been having issues in Arizona getting housing. And I know if we're hearing about it, that means it's happening more than we know. So sometime, sometimes this presentation that Ahmed is doing, you know, there's 12, 13, 15 people, but this community is much larger than that. So you have to also be the ears uh, and the mouth for the community sometimes because they don't, not everybody knows about care. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to detract just a little bit from Ahmed's lesson only because um, when I learned about care, I was in law school in 2006. I'm from Dearborn. I'm Lebanese and I'm Shia. But when I told my dad about care, he goes, oh, this is a Sunni organization. This is a common misperception about care. Everybody thinks, well, this is a Sunni organization. They only support the rights of Sunni. Um, I went to law school. I moved to Arizona from, from Detroit. I, I came here to law school, and I stayed. And I have friends who are part of CARE, who I went to law school with, lawyers and doctors. They're on the board with me, and they asked me to join the board. And the one thing they always asked me is, where is the Shia community in Arizona why are they not why are they not active why are we not more active with care and i said to them why are we not reaching out more as well as an organization to the masjids the mosques that we know and there's only i think 3 that i'm aware of in the valley so i i coincidentally had an availability to come today but i really wanted to come today because I want to help break the, the misconception that care has anything to do with this. It has nothing to do with this. It is all about protecting um, the rights, the civil rights of all Muslims in Arizona. And right now especially, the, the organization is very active because as you all know, if you're Shia right now and you're traveling, there are, they are flagging us. Ten out. I, I'm on a WhatsApp chat from my friends who are lawyers in Detroit. In the airport, if you're Shia, you're in the airport for ten hours. It doesn't matter if you're a U.S. citizen. If you're coming from anywhere in the Middle East, if you're coming from Dubai, if you're coming, if you're flying into Boston or New York or L.A. They, or Detroit, they are stopping people. So most people don't know that hey, if this is happening to me, I cannot hire a lawyer. You know, lawyers, uh, we're very expensive, <laughs> you know. But we also have people like Ahmed and people like me and my friend Rais who are on the board of CARE, who we do not get paid. I'm a volunteer board member, um, who are actively making ourselves available so that if something like this happens, whether it's a housing issue or an employment issue or an issue with travel and your or, or the FBI – knocks on your door and says, hey, we just want to talk to you about, you know, maybe some people who you might see at the mosque. You do not have to talk to them, but you have to know your rights. That's why Ahmed is here. Because if you don't know your rights, you get scared. You don't know what to do. So you say, okay, well, whatever you want, just leave me alone. I'll talk to you. What do you want to know? You have to know your rights. So the first thing you should do is say, well, I'm going to call my attorney first. Give me your card. And I'll get back to you. 
And as soon as you tell them I'm going to call my attorney, they usually just go away <laughs> because they know you're not going to, they know they don't have the right to uh, pressure you, to intimidate you. Anyway, sorry, Ahmed. I wanted to just, I wanted you guys to know, he, he refers to me as David. My mother, I'm fourth generation, third generation. My mother was born and raised, my grandfather was born uh, also in Detroit. My father came from Lebanon in 1973. Uh, my middle name is Ali. My, great, my grandfather is Ali. My mother was born here. My dad is the oldest son. He wanted to name me Ali. My mom said, no, I'm going to name him David, and she won. So anyway, that's the story. One, uh, one thing David didn't add is that because we are a nonprofit, we offer our services mostly pro bono. So what does that mean? I am free and I want to sue. So come to us, thankfully, because how our, uh, we're primarily funded through the community. So alhamdulillah, there is enough. We were growing because not only to be judges, we got to be attorneys. So these are the next care attorneys right here. But I'm free. Um, my job is to take calls. So I mean, if you just want to chit chat about the Lakers, give me a call. So we'll, we'll, we'll jump to the next one now. Law enforcement. David kind of uh, gave a couple sneak peeks there. Obviously, our law enforce, our uh, people in the law enforcement, they're here to protect and serve. If a crime happened to me, I'm calling the police because that is their job. So I'm not saying anything, you know, negative or anything like that. They have a tough job, but they have rules, and it is our job to make sure they don't take shortcuts. That they have to follow our rule, uh, follow those rules. So. The big one, a lot of the times I get the call, hey, you know, FBI agent John came to my house. He said, hey, can I come inside? Or you just want to chit chat? We see something, you know, it's a little strange. Can we talk to you? In David's example, he said, you know, he, you open the door, give him the card. You don't even have to open the door. The only time you have to open that door is if they have a warrant. And they're not waiting for you to open that door. They're coming in. And a warrant has to be signed by a judge. We heard over the summer that ICE was given out. Not fake warrants, but we're calling different documents warrants. So you could say, let me see that warrant. You don't even have to open the door because once you are in a conversation with law enforcement, you have the ability to uh, leave at any time if it's at your home. But if you make a misstatement, not even a straight line, maybe you, they ask you, do you know Muhammad? And you're like, I know a lot of Muhammads, but they ask you, do you know Muhammad A? You're like, I, I don't think I know Muhammad A. And then you say, no, I don't know Muhammad A. And then they're like, well, who's this picture of you and Muhammad A sitting next to each other at prayer? You're like, oh, I mean, this is a guy I see at Friday. Well, that gets you in a dicey situation because if you lie to a federal agent, that's a five-year offense. I mean, that's what got Michael Cohen and uh, the other Trump guy at the latest, lying to law enforcement. And when I say talking to law enforcement, it jumps all the way from the FBI all the way to a Tempe City Police. So it's any law enforcement. You never, ever, ever have to have a voluntary conversation with law enforcement. So if they come to your door, they knock, they say, can we come in? Our recommendation is don't even open the door. Give me your card, my attorney will talk to you. Let's say you open the door and you want to talk to them. Well, don't let them come inside. Step outside of your home and say, you know, give me your card. But they're going to be say, no, no, you know, your neighbors are going to see us. They're going to be like, why is, you know, Ahmed taught, you know, has police problems. Let us just come inside. It'll be real quick. No, because once, they are, once they're inside and if they see something they call suspicious, then they have probable cause. The situation escalates. So always, always our recommendations never open the door. I say all this and I'm the care attorney, but my dad will let those FBI agents come into the home all the time and have that chit chat. He always tells me, Ahmed, you know, I'm, you know, I know I'm not going to lie, and it's easier for me just to have that conversation than, you know, make this a bigger issue. And, I, you know, I try to tell my dad, <laughs> I went to law school. I mean, let me at least talk to them, but that's, that's my dad. So it's a personal decision. You could make that e decision to say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to talk to you guys. We're going to get it over, something like that. But we always recommend that if you do decide to talk to law enforcement, have that attorney by your side. If you don't, that's a decision you have to make. But I'm here to have that conversation, to call. I mean, we just had a call two weeks ago where someone from a federal um, agency wanted to talk to someone. And I said, usually this federal agency doesn't do checkups like this. They're not here for your well-being. They're looking for you to make a mistake. 
And right after I got a call, right when I finished that call with that federal agent, I told that person, you need to go talk to a criminal defense attorney right now because if you do have this conversation, there's a chance that you may be in criminal troubles. And most, I'm not say most, a lot of criminal defense attorneys do free consultation. So I said, at least talk to someone else who does criminal because we don't do any criminal. So if you get you know, a speeding ticket, if you decide to do grand theft auto, don't call care. That's, that's not what I'm here for. But just know that you have such strong criminal defense rights, you have such strong uh, civil liberties that we always recommend to enforce them. So any questions about law enforcement before I go to our fun one, airports? That's the first thing. Go to, go to your parents. Go to your parents. David brought up a good point. I always like to tell people, you know, follow the basic rule. I don't talk to strangers. I know you're wearing a suit. My parents told me not to talk to strangers. I don't know you. You got an issue with me? Here's my, mo here's my parents. Talk to them. The other thing that David brought up, I said all about your house. That's the easiest scenario because it's your house. But if you're walking on the street, they come to you. You're out of your car. They come to you. That's where there's different rights, but still a lot of them. So if you are, if let's say you get pulled over, the, the agent, the, the agent, the uh, police officer gives you the ticket and then wants to continue that conversation. You know, he, he gets you for speeding, but maybe the police officer is fishing because he thinks maybe you have something in the car, or maybe you're someone. The number one thing that if you're gonna take away from other than you don't have to talk is, am I free to go? That's where a lot of the rights hinge on. If you are free to go, then go. Because if you stay there, that's voluntary. You're a, a lot, they can ask you anything. I, my previous job, I was a law clerk for a judge. And we had a case where a gentleman had 300 pounds of cocaine in his car. He was a drug trafficker. He, got, he, missed, he uh, messed up on his lane, so they pulled him over, gave him the ticket. And after he got the ticket, he just stood there and have, had a conversation with a police officer for 10 more minutes. And finally, the police officer says, can I look in the trunk of your car? And he says, yes. I, I was shot. I was about to be like, why did you even say yes? I mean, did you not know what was in your car? But he stood there. He could have asked, am I free to go? He probably wasn't free to go because this person, um, he saw some other stuff that gave him that suspicion to keep on going. But if this was a little bit different, if he would have said, am I free to go right there, he's free to go. Let's say the officer says, no. You're not free to go. Well, that means that you are confined and there are different things, there are different procedures. There are uh, rights of an attorney that are present there. So that's the biggest thing. Am I free to go? So if they come to the street, you know, after they have, you know, who are you? And you say, you know, I'm Ahmed Susi. And they talk about, well, you know, what's in your backpack? Blah, blah, blah. You know, what school do you go to? That, that's, 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 what, that's what you're asking. If you're free to go, you're not detained. They m they're not going to have to tell you. No, no. But once you're detained, that that's where you have the right, and they're going to tell you, you know, you have the right to an attorney. We can provide one for you. And you don't have to talk. You could say, I don't want to talk. I'm going to wait till my I want my attorney here to have any conversation. So that's where, but if you're being detained, there are, that's a whole other field. But if you just stay there and you don't ask anything, and you give them every single thing, just go. And that is my point as far as the criminal defense and the right to talk. So I have a friend of mine who's a criminal defense attorney. On the back of his card, he gives all his clients. And in the back it says, I'm going to paraphrase what it says because I don't know the exact words, but it says, shut up. Don't talk to me. <laughs> don't talk to the you, – if you're not free to go, nothing you say can help you. Nothing. So don't talk. If you're being detained, you have the right to an attorney. I want an attorney. That's the only thing you should say. I want an attorney. Don't try to talk your way out of it because it's not going to work. They've already decided to detain you. 
So you're not going anywhere. I don't want to go to jail for the weekend. Too bad. Go to jail. Because anything you say is just going to get you in more trouble. You're never getting out of there. Okay? So if they tell you you're not free to go, the only words that should come out of your mouth is, I want my lawyer. That's it. You don't have a lawyer? Give me one. They have, they ha you have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to you. So I don't have a lawyer. I can't afford a lawyer. I want a lawyer. They have to give one to you. Well, we won't be able to get you that lawyer till Monday because it's Friday night. I don't care. Don't talk because you're not getting out of trouble. Sure. Mm-hmm. Asking you for your neighbor, like, who who is your neighbor or something like that? or. Mm. So that so that so that's yeah that goes back to the main rule. You never ever ever have to even have that conversation, and you don't and you don't have to help them investigate. I mean, their job is to investigate. So I mean, unless you want to become a police officer and get some experience, that but no, I I mean I would recommend not to. That's a decision you have to you know personally have to make. But even going back to that first step, I mean, the officer is knocking on your door. To you know, first of all, why are you here? Well, I want to get some information on your neighbor. It's up to you if you want to open that door. You don't even have to. You say, well, that, you know, I'm not here for that. But once they told you, you could just say no. They might intimidate you, be like, well, your neighbor's into this. Maybe you're into this. You know, maybe I might look into you. And police officers have the right to lie. They have the right to, they, they, could, they could lie to you. They could say, we already found all the stuff. And then you say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's that intimidation thing, you know. And they might, like I said, they might be like, well, you know, let me come in inside at least. You don't want your neighbors to know. You have to be uh, vigilant in enforcing your rights. Sure. So the question was, can uh, police officers lie? And the answer was no. I don't know the exact, or did I say no? I meant to say yes, I apologize. I don't know the reason, what gives them the power to lie? I don't know. If so the police are, allow, are, are allowed to lie to you as part of their investigation, right? So they can tell you we have this even if they don't have it because the idea is, is if you're telling the truth, their lie, you'll know it's a lie. So it's not really a lie. Because you know they're lying. We saw you with the man before he died. Why? Well, you know you were not with the man before he died, so you know they're lying. But if you were with him, then you will say, oh, he saw me. I might as well tell the truth, right? So the idea is that if they're lying to you, you'll know they're lying, so it's not really harmful. It's a, it's just a police investigation, uh, investigation tactic, and Courts have found that it's acceptable. So if the court says it's acceptable, it's lawful, then it becomes lawful. Any other questions? Or we are jumping to the airports. I always go to the airport three hours early, but I know of a friend who goes four hours early. However, they got him right when he was checking on into the plane, and he was like, I came here four hours early. If you guys were about to stop me, you could have stopped me before I missed this flight. So in the airports, it's a rule that they, the, the government cannot discriminate. They cannot say, we're stopping you because you are Iranian. However, how do you prove that? It's always, it's a random search. It's always, you know, um, you're the next person in number or something like that. So it's, it's hard to prove. I actually think some care chapters are right now uh, looking to see if they had that proof when the first um, a, couple, a couple weeks ago where a bunch of Iranians were stopped in the Washington border. But right now, it's kind of tough to prove that unless they actually say, hey, you know, you with the hijab or you with the big beard, come here, something like that. They're not going to say that. And it's, us and it's not the TSA agent. I'm not, you know, trying to pick on them. It's, it's above their head. Some of them are bad. I'm, I saw a guy once laughing, laughing, and then I actually stood up. He's like, I'll tell you when to come up. I was like, oh, okay, this is one of those guys. So just know, though, that you have the right not to be uh, discriminated at the airport. You also have the rights to and practice your religion. So if you are a female and you don't want to be patted by a man, you have the right for a f another female TSA agent to pat you down. Or if you are a man and you want another man to pat you down, you have that right. You also have the right to take off your hijab 
in a private room if you don't want other people to see you. At the airport, though, it gets a little bit tricky when it comes to what can they take from you. Because right now, the big thing is they're asking for your computer, they're asking for your laptop, all, you know, all your electronics. And we get calls that some TSA agents actually ask for social media accounts, ask for you to unlock your phone, ask you to unlock this or that. It's being litigated right now, so. And entering the U.S., correct, so coming back into the country. Um, it's being litigated right now, a lot of this stuff, so there's only so many bright line rules. One of them is, if you are a citizen, they cannot deny you entry back into the country by if you don't give them your information. So if they say, what's your you know, iPhone password? You have the right to say no, and they cannot deny you entry. If you are a legal permanent resident, if you are, um, if you're immigration, if you're not a citizen, then definitely talk to an immigration attorney because that's a little bit different. But they cannot deny a citizen entry back into the country. What we always recommend, it's, it's not the most practical advice, but if you can do it, definitely do it, is to travel data light. Because if they take your stuff, there's a chance that they may see something that you wouldn't want to see. And I'm not saying like bad stuff, but let's say you have pictures of your family. Maybe you don't want them to see those pictures. Or maybe you, know, you have emails that are sensitive and you don't want that information to get into anybody. So you yeah. Look, uh, I went back to Michigan to sit and have dinner with some of my friends. My brother-in-law is also a lawyer. And we were sitting with two doctors and an engineer, and we're having dinner at a restaurant outside, and we're talking about politics. And the people at the table said, shh, stop, 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 stop talking. And they're afraid. They don't want to talk because we're talking, you know, Lebanon politics. You know, it's some controversial things. And everybody's afraid. They're looking. They're listening. They're watching. And you know what? To some extent, they are. But I personally don't care. I'm a lawyer. I know that I'm interested. I want to see what's happening right now in the Middle East. So my dad, he's always on websites. He's, well, he's watching videos of, you know, for example, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah is speaking, and he's going to watch the speech. And so I don't think that's a problem. The problem for us is if we're traveling abroad and we're coming back, and they check your phone, and they see that you're watching – something like this, or they're watching you speak about, they're watching you, y your ser searches are about, you know, for example, yeah, even Quran or Salat or, or, you know, you're reading things of, you're watching lectures, religious things, they will use this as a basis for holding you, for investigating, for interrogating. So even though it's nothing illegal, there's nothing wrong with listening to a political speech or getting your news from, you know, different uh, media outlets who share us share with us the other perspective rather than just what they tell us on CNN. But if you're, if you don't want to stay at the airport for ten hours, maybe you want to clear your history, <laughs> right? You don't want to be traveling back into the U.S. with your search history showing these types of, even though they're not illegal, they will just create problems for you. So if you don't want to have problems when you're traveling from the Middle East or anywhere, actually, not just from the Middle East, if you're coming back into the U.S. and your name is Muhammad or Ali or whatever, and they see your passport, yeah, we're going to randomly select you, and we're going to look at your computer, and we're going to look at your iPhone, and if you're watching these things, you're asking for trouble. Even though it's not illegal, you're just, you're, you want to avoid this, just, that's right. So just clear those histories. Maybe take a spare laptop that you don't use for, <laughs> for searching if you just need a laptop with you. So, I mean, that and th David brings up a good point. Yes, because let's say, this is just, s so there's Customs and Border Patrol. Those are the people who do the border. Then there's the actual TSA agents who are going to be wearing you know, the blue shirts, everything like that. And then there's going to be FBI agents. Usually these people are in plain clothes. And this is what happened to my friend, my, my cousin.
when he got stopped, it was FBI agents who wanted to talk to him. We're, we're from Benghazi, you know, we're always, we're always doing stuff over there. But, so, you know, they're asking him, you know, uh, do you listen to this sheikh, do you listen to this? And I mean, when I get these calls, sometimes I'm shocked because I'm like, these FBI agents know so much about Islam, <laughs> you know, what, what's, what's, what's happening here? So, and in that situation, you have the right to have an attorney. They're not gonna tell you that because technically, in some situations, if you say, can I leave? They say, okay, but we're gonna hold on to your passport. So can you really leave? No. But right now, the courts say that's not detainment. But if it's in a situation where they have you detained, and what a Custom and Borders Patrol agent can talk to you about is what, what happened on your trip. Like, where'd you come? Where'd you go? Stuff like that. But once they start asking, okay, so you went to Lebanon. Did you go to this masjid? Or you went to Pakistan. Did you go to this Did you see this person? That is not okay. And you don't have to answer those questions. But if let's say you're in that FBI scenario, you could ask for an attorney. But it's something that David brought up. It's a decision you want to make. The previous care attorney had a situation where he got stopped coming back. And he just decided, you know what, I'm just going to answer these questions because I don't want to wait here for eight hours. I'd just rather, I know what, you know, the truth. They might try to trick me up. That's not going to work. But you have that right. So it's up to you if you want to actually enforce it. Any other questions from up here? That it depends on where you're at. So, so the question was, um, if you ask for an attorney and they say you don't have the right to an attorney, you always, no matter if you're not, if you're applying for immigration, you don't have an attorney, so that is an exception. But if you're in a conversation with law enforcement and you ask for an attorney, you have that right. You don't always have the right for it to be provided, though. So you say, can I, t I, I want to talk to my attorney. They're like, okay, cool, call one, <laughs> you know, something like that. They don't always have to provide you. If you are detained and they're actually bringing charges, then yes, you have the, the right to an, an attorney. But we always recommend that if we have right now, because of the ongoing uh, travel issues, we have on our website where you could actually register your trip per se, say, hey, I'm going on this month, I'm, coming on, I'm going on this date, I'm coming back on this date. You know, if here are some contact numbers, if I'm, if you know, these people call you and say, I haven't been heard from in a couple hours, then that's where we'll come in and we'll try to help you in that detainment. Around uh, the Muslim ban, this happened to a lot of people. People were in the air, Muslim ban was uh, started, and a lot of people were being sent back, a lot of people were being detained, a lot of people would be given paperwork to forfeit rights. Never sign anything if you haven't read it. And if you have read it, get your lawyer to read it to, to double check. So you have that right, it's just a little bit, um, it's not you ask for one and poof, one appears. Did you want to add anything to that? Or? Because it's sort of what we just talked about earlier before you asked the question. If you say I want an attorney and he says you don't have a right to an attorney, that's because you haven't been detained. And if you haven't been detained, then you're free to go. So you say, so I don't have a right to an attorney, does that mean I'm free to go? If he says no, then you have a right to an attorney. So there's no, nothing to be confused about. If you don't have a right to an attorney, it's because you're free to go. And if you're not free to go, then you have a right to an attorney. And you may not be able to pick up the phone and call one because it may be, you may be at the mall on a Saturday and care office is closed and you don't have a personal attorney that you can just call from your cell phone. You're not getting out of trouble. You can talk all you want. You're still going to jail, so shut up. You understand? You can think, oh, I can... I don't want to go to jail. You're going to jail. Don't try to talk your way out of it. Call, leave a message at the care office. At the end of this, we should make sure, I think we have the cards, right? Everybody will have our number. Real quick before we go to the question. I definitely have all my cards. We have two questions. Uh, and our contact information will be on this PowerPoint. Care is open Monday through Friday, but I check the calls on Saturday and Sunday, so... If something is an emergency, you know, leave a message and I'll definitely hear. Might not respond that day, but if it's if it's uh, you know an actual situation, definitely. So the question was an update on the Muslim ban. Only you know Trump and his people know the exact, uh, but there the rumors are that yes, there's going to be more countries added. There's been rumor countries that are being put on. Uh, 
in a situation like this, I, I look at this news two ways. One, I feel it's a way to stop those people who are already in the process of coming to come. Like, we don't even want you here, don't come. And in that case, I say, no, if you are already coming, if you already have like you know your, your visa, everything like that, definitely get here as soon as you can. The other thing is, if it were to happen, right now it's, uh, it's still being litigated, this situation, so it, I don't see a way to solve it 100% then without political power. But if new countries get added, there is supposedly a waiver process. A waiver process doesn't work that well, but there is a waiver process, and there is a lawsuit right now challenging the waiver process. So I'm kind of giving you a wait to see type answer, but if it does come out and new countries are added, I think that it really depends on what happens in 2020, but let's say you know we have more administration. The lawsuits that are coming up right now challenging the waiver process, I think that has some legs, but I can't tell you 100%. So. We had a, yeah. Correct. We had a question on if you get four S's on your passport. That was actually my first client at Care Arizona. We had someone with four S's. I'm going to give you another two part answer. So, first, when you get stopped, there is a government uh, form that you're supposed to fill out that's supposed to say, hey, I was stopped. What's the reason? Because there's two lists. There's the no-fly list. You're not flying at all. And there's the second list where it's a bigger net where they have people like, these are maybe people. A lot of the times there's reports that these people are just there because of an accident. You know, someone on the keyboard controlled shift and brought 30,000. Or, or sometimes it's... Um, false information that got someone there. And this form, in theory, is supposed to be the due process. It's supposed to be the, the review to see is this person supposed to be on this list. The person that I helped him done it twice. He filled out this form twice, and they still have him as four S's. Even if he, so it, it, it's if he buys the tickets. He flew with his 80-year-old grandmother, and they did a search on his grandmother just because they were connected. CARE is actually suing or in a lawsuit right now, they got just got the ruling a couple of months ago that said that this process is not constitutional. The list wasn't decided if it was constitutional, but just this, you fill out this form and then they send you an answer that says, hey, you know, you may be on the list, you might not be on the list, but use this number, this should help you. So judges are deciding right now to see what's the proper remedy. The thing is, this is the first level judge. So he's this person's gonna make a decision then it's going to be appealed, and then it's going to the Supreme Court. So right now, I would say, Phil, the, tell, uh, you said it was your cousin. So tell your cousin the next time they fly, they're probably going to have the same scenario come to us. So we CARE is looking for new plaintiffs. So he, this person might be, be able to add it as a plaintiff. And what we found is a lot of times when we add plaintiffs, the government's just like, hey, let's just get this person out of here. Let's just solve their issue. So definitely I'll get my card and send that information. Okay. So th there's there's two parts. So the first is you're going to get questioned, maybe, probably. Th the question was, if I post something on social media, um, can I be arrested and can I be questioned? Questioned? Yeah, that's that's going to that's how they build these cases. They say this person posts this this this, and a lot of times, they do a um, situation where they'll try to lie to you and say, hey, you know, this person is you've been posting this, you've been posting that. It'd be like, I don't even use Twitter, so I don't know why you're <laughs> you know you guys messed up. Can you get arrested? Most of the time, no, but let's say you do a death threat or something like that. That's where you have cause. I'm gonna let David add anything. So if all you're doing is putting a picture or 
giving an opinion, like I disagree, you know. So Sayyid Hassan, for example, is a leader of Hezbollah, and according to the United States, they are classified as a terrorist organization. So you do have to be careful about what you say on social media posts. I have been in arguments with people on Twitter. I get off Twitter now because of too many arguments. But I have been on, uh, in arguments with other people when they would attack the Sayyid or they would attack this organization claiming it's this. I can disagree. I can say this is not true. This is propaganda. You know, they're defending their country. I, they have the right to do that. But what I cannot do, even as an American citizen, lawyer, I cannot say, I cannot send money. This is supporting, according to the United States, this is supporting terrorism, right? So you have to be careful. Speech is very highly protected. So if you post something on Facebook that says, I love the Sayyid, so what? This is not illegal, it's not a crime. However, if you say, you know, I recommend and I am gonna send uh, money to support this and I'm sending money, now you are creating a problem and you have to be careful what you put on social media and what you say on social media. Um, so I'm not sure what the Trump story was. She may have made a threat. I'm gonna do something bad to the president. I'm, and it has to be what's called a true threat, not just a joke. If I say I wish Trump, the, his Air Force, to yeah, this is not a crime. You could say that. I wish that all the time. So what? So, I mean, um, follow, follow up with that case because, I mean, they might have just arrested her, but when they actually had to come with the proof, then they may probably say we have nothing. So we're going to jump from law enforcement. We just talked a lot about what rights we have. And every time I said, you have this right, but it's a decision that you have to make to enforce it. No one's gonna say, hey, you know, the person who's discriminating against you is gonna be like, hey, you have these rights, you wanna do it, that's a decision you have to make. So one of my favorite civil rights leaders, I'm gonna show you guys their picture. Does anyone know who this girl is? I, I got a raised hand in the back. Was that a, was that a scratch or? Okay, all right. Any, any? Close, 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 same time, same time period. So this is Ruby Bridges. She's the first uh, black person to integrate schools in the US. She actually integrated a school in Louisiana. So you know, I have a little of my Louisiana uh, roots there. She had to be walked into the school with US Marshals because the crowds that the people who didn't want her to have the same education as white students were harassing her so much that the federal marshals had to walk her in. And I always tell myself that this six-year-old made the decision to be the first person to integrate schools, say, I deserve an education just as much as you. I'm not going to let anyone stop me. I'm going to go to school. I mean, I always tell my mom, I'm not trying to go to school. I'm trying to do the fake sleep. I'm like, <coughs> this person wanted to go to school so much, she's like, I'm not going to let these people stop me. So I always tell myself, if Ruby Bridges can enforce her rights, then I can say when the, someone tries to discriminate against me, be like, no, I need Fridays off. I'm gonna wear, you know, I'm gonna wear my hijab. I'm not gonna talk to you because these are my rights. And Ruby and the people before her fought for her rights. Now, usually when I show this picture, people are like, oh, this is 1775. You know, this person is dead. Everything like that. This is Ruby Bridges today. She's 65 years old. So, you know, less than 70 years ago. Schools weren't integrated. So we've come a long way, but there's still so much to go. So sometimes we could get kind of complacent. Now, I mean, you know, 2016 definitely jumped a lot of Muslims into action. What I hope is that whatever happens in the next election, that this political active ac activity doesn't just stop. I have our contact number and our website. I also have cards, but just give me two more minutes because I also want to talk to you guys about the census. So any other questions real quick before I... Jump to the census. Definitely. 
So the question was, do, does CARE represent international students? CARE represents anyone. Doesn't matter what their citizenship status. I mean, we share our office with DACA recipients, and I would defend them no, as I would defend anyone else. So doesn't matter, you know, your whatever religion you are, it's what resources we have. I'm the only attorney until you all, you guys high school, middle school, high school, until you guys become lawyers, I'm the only attorney there, so it's whatever I, you know, I can handle at that point, but we defend anyone. So if you have a case, come talk to me, we'll, we'll listen. I'm gonna jump now to the census, because right now we talked about enforcing our rights. Definitely, if you're not registered to vote, and you're 18 and you're a citizen, come talk to me, or RSLE on the other side, because we have registration forms. That's the first, if you don't vote, you can't really, I don't think you could make, you have room to complain. But another aspect in 2020 is the census. Does everyone know what the census is? Oh, uh, <laughs> so the census is basic, it's in the Constitution, it's one of the you know, provisions in there that says every 10 years we have to count how many people there are in the country. The last census was in 2010. I was in high school, I didn't care about the census, so I'm like, what is this even? But now, because of certain cases, a lot of people have been afraid, saying, oh, you know, there's a citizenship question, you know, a lot of the undocumented community. And being in Arizona, these people are, are our community. They're our brothers and sisters who say, I don't want to do the census because I'm afraid they're going to get my information. ICE might get informa my information. The FBI might get my information. They might know, you know, six people live here or something like that. Well, first of all, that citizenship question is not on the census. The Supreme Court said no. But it is a federal uh, violation if the Census Bureau were to give out your personal information. So the census information stays with them. It's each household, so it's not like, you know, the Susie family could all do the census. It's, it's each household does the census. And what are the advantages of the census? Well, first, they'll say, hey, in this place, in Arizona, there are three million more people have gr came here in the last 10 years. It's probably a lot more than that, but let's just say it was three million. Arizona needs more federal funding, so more money comes down. The biggest reason why I think the census is important is it calculates how many representatives we have in the House of Representatives. I'm gonna ask you guys, because you're in high school, how many senators do we have? Yeah. Two, two, so we're always gonna have two senators, but how many representatives we have in Congress in the House of Representatives depends on the census. Right now we have nine. Do you guys know who your congressperson is? I didn't know who was mine was, but do you guys know who yours is? It, one of them, that's, that's a good answer. That's, that's, that's how you know you're a future lawyer. Answering, but not answering. <laughs> so um, there's nine, but Arizona grew. I would be shocked if we didn't grow enough to get another one. And what I love is because I want you guys to understand that politics, even though it seems you know, far away and you gotta be, you know, look a certain look, have a certain dress, but that's not true at all. We just saw you know, two Muslim women become Congress people. You wanna run for Congress, you run for Congress. And the more slots there are, that means the more different opinions there are for us to run. And you know, hopefully this next election, we have two more and two more and two more. So definitely felt the census because we don't want Arizona to lose a representative. You know, you remember how we have two senators? Well, the, both North and South have four senator Dakotas, and you know, Dakota, they do stuff over there, but Arizona, I think we're a great place, and let's get more of you guys in Congress. No, not the senators, the House of, uh, House of Representatives, so. That's gonna end my presentation. If anyone has questions, I'm, I'm gonna be here. So, one of, the, one of the things that CARE does, we've been really active in doing, is getting money from organizations that ask us to do voter registration and census work. Because, and why, why do we do it, is because how are we gonna write the laws that we can use to get Eid off, or um, or write the laws that say that Arizona cannot pass a law making it illegal to boycott, for example, BDS, you know, the, the boycott. So there's a BDS, I don't wanna get into the BDS conversation, but 
boycott is speech. We say we protest. We don't want, for example, occupation of uh, the West Bank. We want to boycott. Well, Arizona passed a law that said you, if you boycott, you cannot do business with us. We sued. CARE sued the uh, Arizona State University, and they changed their rule. So, but, but the census matters, and, and vo us as a community voting matters because why would anybody in the state legislature or in the U.S. Congress care, not care, but care, what you want as a Muslim if you don't even vote? Why do I care what you want? You guys don't vote, so you can't get me out of office. You don't donate money, and so obviously some people, you know, don't have money to donate to political po politicians, but even if it's, I'm gonna give $25, they see activism, if they see that we as a community are active in politics, we get together as a community, we come together as a community, and we, we don't always have to agree on everything, but if we vote together, then we have more power. So if they know, boy, CARE has 15,000 Muslims, who are members, or there's no real membership because we represent everybody. They are our supporters, our followers on Facebook, our follow, we, like we have 800 followers on Facebook. Man, I have, we have 600 people come to our banquet and we have to send people away because we don't have enough room. And why do we only have 700 or 800 followers? We should have, we have 50,000 Muslims in Arizona. We should have 50,000 followers, right? Because if we did, then when we, when people from our organization need something or go to the Congress and say, this is wrong, fix it, change it, we have more power. So we agreed to become uh, and to talk about the census because it's important that we fill it out so that we are represented, that we are counted, but it's also important that we vote if we are legally able to vote. If we're not legally able to vote, we should not be voting. So my, I, I do wanna ask of the people over the age of 18, how, how many people are U.S. citizens and able to vote? And are you registered to vote? You registered to vote? I know you guys are not registered yet. You are registered already to vote? Okay. All right. So if, if you're not, do we have re voter registration? Okay. If, we, if you're not registered to vote, it takes literally, what, 60 seconds? 85 seconds to fill out the form. Fill out the form. What does it do? Number one, if you fill out the form, we will help you get registered to vote. But number two, we are able to go back to the organizations that care about this stuff and say, hey, we registered three voters today on Friday. We registered next week two voters. Even if we come back and say we registered 65 people in the year, that matters. Because it's 65 people who they know are worried about the same things that they're worried about. So we've become very active at working with non-Muslim civil rights organizations too because the people who are, who are defending the Latin Americans, the Hispanic Americans, the Mexican Americans who are being targeted, they are also coming when the Muslim ban happened, we were at the airport, you weren't here yet, but we went to the airport in Phoenix and I literally almost cried. Because I saw white people, black people, Mexican people, everybody. I looked around and the whole terminal four, the street, the sidewalk was packed with signs. And I said, man, we have a chance. This state can be a great state. We have, but we can't just worry. Care cannot only worry about, well, are they, must, are they bothering the, the Muslim people? We have to step up when they're bothering the Mexican people because guess what? When, they, when, we, when they're bothering us, the Mexican people are coming to, our, to help us. That's the only way we're gonna have strength because look, in America, we only have 3.5 million Muslims out of 350 people or 1%. So we need to have the support of other minority communities. Um, that's all I have. Census starts March 12th, that's an important date. Second thing, um, you know, I was a broke college student, but I still called the, my Congress people and told them, hey, listen, I have, you know, asthma, 
don't you know vote for this because I need this. So you know you don't have to. Money is the way they listen. But if they get five calls about one issue, they're listening. So um, if you have any questions, like I said, we do voter registration. The tea is delicious, by the way. So I definitely need to know: is it just a Lipton bag or or, or what is this? But <laughs> okay, I'll, I I need to get some of that. I, this is delicious. But thank you guys and. If you have questions on the women's side, Arcelli, let me know and, and I'll be there. But thank you guys for spending time with me today. Mm -hmm.